Hello, everyone. Welcome to week three of our introduction to the racing rules. Um, so whether you've been, you've already watched the first two weeks, um, or whether you're just starting here, um, welcome to you all. This session will build on the previous two. Um, so if you haven't had a chance yet, you can go back and look at the recordings of those um, if you haven't seen them yet. Because um, as I say, this will build on some of the stuff we've already um, already been uh, talking about. Before I introduce um, our speaker, I'm just going to give you um, a little reminder. If you're watching us live um, tonight, then please, I invite you to ask any questions you have in the chat window to the right hand side. Our speaker will be available and answering the questions as you put them in there. And um, so I really encourage you to take advantage of that. Um, if you're watching us later um, or uh, later on having been recorded, then I ask you put your comments in the comments bar below and those will be monitored and we'll we'll get around to answering those as well. So just to introduce our speaker, um, this is Neil McLeod. He is the RYA's Racing Services Manager, whose responsibilities include managing the RYA's work in regards to the racing rules of sailing, race officials, and he acts as the secretary to the Racing Rules Committee. He's also a World Sailing International Judge and Umpire, and when not officiating, he races on IRC yachts in the Solent and back at home in Scotland. So thank you very much. Um, I'm going to hand over to Neil. Uh, thanks very much, Chris. Uh, welcome everybody. So uh, tonight, what we're uh, we're going to be covering in this episode, we're going to do a quick quick recap of the rules introduced in in episode one and two by Chris and then Matt, and then we're going to kind of dive into obstructions. We're going to look at what is an obstruction, uh, what is a continuing obstruction, uh, and when the rules apply. And then we're going to look at the, the two rules around obstruction. So there's rule 19, which will cover passing an obstruction, and then rule 20, which is going to cover tacking an obstruction. So over the, the previous two episodes, here's what we, we've covered so far. Uh, in episode one, Chris covered the, the right of way rules. You can see there in the, the top left circle, that's 10 through to uh, 13. And then in episode two, Matt introduced us to some of the rules that limit what the right of way boat can do. So you covered off 15 and then part of 16. So tonight I, I'm going to further expand on 16. I'm going to do the, the second part of rule 16, which, which Matt didn't cover uh, in the previous episode. So then I'm going to look at rule 17 and then get into the, the meat of it, which will be around obstructions with 19 and 20. And then we'll just touch a little bit on, on rule 23, which is one of the extra ones. OK, so a quick recap for everybody. Um, have a think uh, what rules require another boat to keep clear. Uh, so just have a think about that and uh, jot down or try and remember any that you can think of and see how many you can get. Okay, so the answer to that is seven. Uh, some of you might have said four, uh, thinking of these four right of way rules, uh, which Chris covered in the in the first episode, being uh, rule ten, port and starboard; rule eleven, windward leeward; twelve, clear ahead, clear astern; and thirteen, we're tacking. Those are all section A rules, and uh, if you remember nothing else, then remember these rules. Now, there are actually three additional rules that require a boat to keep clear of another boat. Now, Matt, in, in episode two, covered off two of these, being starting errors and backing a sail. Uh, and then there's one additional one as well, which is taking penalties, which we'll go over in a minute. Now, these three are, these are what are known as section D rules. And when they apply, then the section A, the normal right of way rules, do not apply. Now, those four from section A and the three from section D, those are seven rules that define when a boat is required to keep clear of another one. They will, there will always be one of those rules that will apply in every scenario. So the first thing you need to do when looking at a scenario is identify which is a keep clear boat, and it will be governed by one of these seven rules. So, what about taking penalties, that, that extra one that we haven't quite covered yet? So rule 22.2 .2 says 
A vote that's taking a penalty shall keep clear of one that is not. So in the diagram here in the right, we've got the yellow bolt taking a penalty, a blue bolt coming up on, on port tack, going upwind. So at positions four and five, you can see that the yellow bolt is on starboard tack, whilst the blue bolt is in port tack, but yet it is a yellow bolt which has to keep clear of the blue bolt because the yellow bolt is taking a penalty. And those section D rules and uh, and rule 22 will take precedence over the section A rules. So in episode one, uh, Chris showed us this, this flow diagram and demonstrating how we can decide which boat has right of way or is keep clear. We're going to slightly add to that, make it a little bit more complicated, we're upping the level as we go through these, these episodes. So we now see that the, the first thing we need to ask ourselves is, is anybody returning to start, taking a penalty, or backing a sale? If the answer to that is yes, then one of the rules from Rule 22 is going to apply, and we can forget about the rest. If the answer is no, which nine times out of 10 it will be, then we go into the rest of the diagram that Chris talked us through in, in episode one. So is anybody tacking? If they are, then Rule 13 is going to apply. Is anybody on, the, are, the, are you on the same tack? So then uh, if it's no, then it will be rule 10, important starboard. Or if you are in the same tack, are you overlapped? No, it was clear ahead, clear astern. And if it's yes, then it will be rule 11, so windward, leeward. So that's just a very quick recap of the, the right of way rules and the keep clear rules. If you want any further information on that, I suggest you go back and look again at episode one where Chris covered them in a much more depth. So now we're gonna move on to the, uh, the limitations on the right of way boat. So this is continuing on from episode two where Matt, Matt looked at, and we are gonna cover in particular rule 16.2 and 17. So this here is rule 16. 16.1 uh, that's in, in grey there, Matt covered that in episode two, so we're not really going to look at that. We're going to look at 16.2, which says, in addition, when after the starting signal, a port tack boat is keeping clear by sailing to pass a stern of a starboard tack boat, the starboard tack boat shall not change course if, as a result, the port tack boat would immediately need to change course to continue keeping clear. So before we go in that, let's just remind ourselves about the definition of keep clear. So a boat keeps clear of a right of way boat. If the right of way boat can sail her course with no need to take avoiding action. And when the boats are overlapped, if the right of way boat can also change course in both directions without immediately making contact. Now we're going to be, we're focusing on the upwind leg here. So it's really just that part A of the definition that we're going to be looking at in in this rule here. Now I've also highlighted there and read a couple of key phrases in that rule that we, we need to be aware of. So first is after the starting signal. So this rule doesn't apply during the pre-start, uh, but as soon as the starting gun goes, then this rule applies for the rest of the race. Uh, and the second phrase there is the immediately. So for the starboard tack boat to have broken rule 16.2, the port tack boat would have to immediately need to change course in order to keep clear. Uh, so let's just keep that in our mind as, as we go through. So here we can see um, in this situation, <clears throat> the blue boat is approaching on port, uh, the yellow boat on starboard. At position two, blue boat starts to bear off. Uh, it's going to sail, sail to pass a stern of the yellow starboard tack boat. And then somewhere between position three and four, yellow alters her course. And now that alteration of course by yellow has meant that blue has had to immediately change her course in order to continue keeping clear. So in that scenario, the yellow boat has broken rule 16.2. Now, if we look at this scenario, um, you can see there, have a, have a quick look at it and think about it. And what would you decide? 
Do you think rule 16.2 has been broken or not? Uh, so the answer here is no. And the reason for that is because of that immediate uh, word that's in the rule. So here, a uh, position two, blue has borne off. She's sailing to pass the stern of the yellow boat. Between position two and three, the yellow boat changes her course. But the blue boat, the port tack boat, does not immediately need to change her course to continue keeping clear. She could have continued sailing on her heading she was on for a little bit longer before she would have needed to, to change course. So in this scenario, yellow has not broken 16.2. Now that's all we're going to say on 16.2. It's not a rule that comes up very often. Uh, it's really in the rule book just to address one particular uh, potential scenario, which is uh, boats dialing down at each other, uh, which is the potential to become quite dangerous. So that's why that rule is, is in there. Now, rule 17. Uh, Matt mentioned this a little bit last week, uh, but you didn't go into it in an awful lot of detail. So we're going to cover it a bit more. Uh, so let's just remind ourselves of what it says. If a boat clear astern becomes overlapped within two of her hull lengths to leeward of a boat in the same tack, she shall not sail above her proper course while they remain on the same tack and overlapped within that distance, unless in doing so, she promptly sails astern of the other boat. This rule does not apply if the overlap begins while the windward boat is required by rule 13 to keep clear. So we'll just remind ourselves here of the definition of proper course. A proper course is defined as a course a boat would sail to finish as soon as possible in the absence of other boats referred to in the rule using the term. A boat has no proper course before her starting signal. So what that means is if, if we take away the, the other boat that's in the scenario, if we forget about it, if it wasn't there, then what would the boat that we're talking about be doing? If it's doing what it would be doing without that other boat there, then it is sailing its proper course. If it's doing something different, then it probably isn't. And now that final sentence there in Rule 17, uh, this rule does not apply if the overlap begins while the windward boat is required by Rule 13 to keep clear. Uh, rule 13, if we remember back to Episode 1 with Chris, Rule 13 is while tacking. Uh, so if a boat is tacking and she is tacking from the minute she passes head to wind, until she reaches a close hauled course. So if she's subject to rule 13 when that overlap is established, then rule 17 does not apply. So Matt showed us this scenario in episode two. So the starting signal's just gone, but what is Blue's proper course? Well, if we pop back up the definition of proper course there, it's the course a boat would sail to finish as soon as possible in the absence of other boats referred to in the rule using the term. So if that green and red boat was not there, then what would blue be doing? That's what we need to ask ourselves. So it's clear that in order to finish as soon as possible, blue first needs to start correctly. And so she needs to be able to cross the starting line without hitting the pin and be able to get round it. So in this scenario, Blue's proper course is to luff to be able to get past that pin. Now, if we were to look at a similar scenario, but without the starting line, then what changes? So what's Blue's proper course now? Well, you see rule 17 definitely applies. In position one, Blue is clear astern of the green boat. And then by position two, she has generated that overlap into leeward or green. Position three, she then luffs, but what is her proper course? Well, if that green or red boat wasn't there and Blue's just sailing upwind, she would have no reason to luff. That wouldn't be what she would be doing to try and finish as soon as possible. So in this scenario, that is above Blue's proper course and she's breaking rule 17. So we've agreed that Blue's breaking rule 17. But what about the windward boats? What do they have to do? Um, 
Well, the fact that Blue is breaking Rule 17 doesn't stop the windward boats from having to keep clear. So Rule 17 places an obligation upon the right-of-way boat, but it does not entitle the keep clear boat to room. So the keep clear boats still as windward boats have to keep clear of blue and their only remedy in that scenario is to protest if they believe that blue is breaking rule 17. Now if we move on we remember that final sentence in rule 17 about uh, if the overlap begins while the windward boat was required by rule 13 to keep clear. So here in position three, we can see that we've got blues on starboard and yellow started to luff, but she's still on port. So still in opposite tax. And by position four, a yellow's now past head to wind. So she's now tacking. She's on starboard tack because she is past head to wind, but she is now a tacking boat. And so she's subject to rule 13 uh, and she is clear ahead of blue at this point. Now, position five, yellow is still above close hold, so she's still subject to rule 13. She still hasn't completed her tack yet, and blue is now overlapped to leeward of her. And finally, in position six, yellow has now reached a close hold course, and so she's now completed her tack. She's no longer subject to rule 13. But because that overlap was established while she was subject to rule 13 back at position five, rule 17 now doesn't apply to blue and blue is able to luff above her proper course. So that's all we're gonna say on rule 17 for now. Uh, rule 17 is really, a, it doesn't come into play that much in the windward leg. It tends to come in a lot more and with reaching legs and downwind running legs. And so Mark Russell will cover this in a lot more detail uh, in episode five when he talks about the run. So now we're gonna move on to the meat of tonight's uh, episode, uh, talking about obstructions or things that we don't want to hit. So before we go into the rules around obstructions, first we need to agree on what an obstruction actually is in terms of the rules. So which of these do you think count as an obstruction in the rules? So of those options, three are an obstruction. Uh, a shoreline, a boat that is capsized, and a starboard tacker being approached by two port tackers. Uh, now we'll, we're going to go through the definition of obstruction and hopefully once we've gone through and explained the definition, you'll be able to see why uh, of these five options, three of them definitely are an obstruction and two aren't. So what is the definition? <clears throat> well, the definition of an obstruction is an object that a boat could not pass without changing course substantially if she were sailing directly towards it and one of her hull lengths from it. An object that can be safely passed on only one side and an area so designated by the sailing instructions are also obstructions. However, a boat racing is not an obstruction to other boats unless they are required to keep clear of her or if rule 23 applies, avoid her. A vessel underway, including a boat racing, is never a continuing obstruction. So that's a pretty wordy definition. Uh, it's, I think it's probably one of the longest definitions we've got at the front of the rule book. Uh, so let's see if we can try and break it down a bit and make it a bit easier to understand. So we can see here that we can, we can really break this definition down into four parts, each of the four sentences. And we'll go through each of these in turn now and try and explain them. So if we take that first sentence, an object that a boat could not pass without changing course substantially if she were sailing directly towards it and one of her hull lengths from it. So if you are pointing straight at what you think might or might not be an obstruction, if you're aiming straight at it, 
and you're only one whole length away from it, are you going to have to make a substantial course change or not? So if it's something like a moored boat, then yeah, if you're one whole length away from it, you're probably going to need to make a fairly substantial course change to get past it. If it's something like a a, a log in the water or a, a mooring ball, then it's going to be a very small alteration, of course. You're going to need to be at past it, and that's not, it wouldn't be an obstruction. Now, if we go on to the, the, second, the second sentence in the definition, an object that can be safely passed on only one side and an area so designated by the sailing instructions are also obstructions. So that could be something like a, an area of shallows. Um, some clubs put in their sailing instructions that, that certain areas are obstructions. And maybe an area between a pontoon and the shoreline, well, that might be defined as an obstruction. So that might be what, we, what we'd find there. At the third sentence, however, a boat racing is not an obstruction to other boats unless they are required to keep clear of it, or if Rule 23 applies, avoid her. So in the bottom left picture there, we can see there's a green boat on starboard and blue and yellow boats approaching her on port. In this scenario, the green boat is an obstruction to the blue and yellow boats because they are required to keep clear of her under Rule 10. On the right-hand scenario, which is a mirror image, green boat on port being approached by a yellow and blue boat on starboard. The green boat is not an obstruction because blue and yellow are not required to keep clear of her. Green is required to keep clear of them. Now, Rule 23, what's that, you might be wondering? Well, Rule 23 covers capsized, anchored or aground or rescuing. And it says, if possible, a boat shall avoid a boat that is capsized or has not regained control after capsizing, is anchored or aground, or is trying to help a person or vessel in danger. A boat is capsized when our masthead is in the water. So in that bottom right scenario there that we just said that green wasn't an obstruction, well, if the green boat there was capsized or had just righted herself from a capsize and hadn't yet regained control, then she would be an obstruction uh, to blue and yellow. So that's what that bit means. And then the final sentence of the obstruction definition is a vessel underway, including a boat racing, is never a continuing obstruction. So we don't actually have a definition of what continuing obstruction is, uh, but generally it's it, normally it would be a shoreline. Uh, is what is, is generally considered as a continuing obstruction. Uh, so the beach would be, but a big ship uh, which is underway would not be. Um, now, if the big ship was at anchor uh, and you're racing Optimus, for instance, then it could well be that, that the big ship was a continuing obstruction, but only if it was at anchor, not if it was underway. So now that we know what an obstruction is, we need to understand when the rules actually apply. So the two rules we're going to cover in this episode are really rules 19 and 20, which cover obstructions, and they are located in section C, uh, along with rule 18 on markroom. So the preamble of section C says, section C rules do not apply as starting marks surrounded by navigable water, or at its anchor line from the time boats are approaching them to start until they have passed them. So Matt went over this a little bit last week. What that really means is if you're coming into the committee boat with about 20, 30 seconds to go, so you're on your final approach, then these rules are not going to apply. You can forget about them in that final approach. They're, they're, not, they're not going to apply. Uh, but if you're if you're messing around pre-start and sailing around, so say two three minutes to go, uh, then they are going to apply, and they're go you're going to need to think about them. Remember as well that phrase surrounded by navigable water. Um, so if for instance you're you're going off a shore start, um, then 
chances are the the rules are going to apply even when you are approaching line to start. So what options have we got at an obstruction? Well, there's really three different things that you can choose to do when you come across an obstruction in your way. Uh, you can either pass it by, by luffing, passing it to windward, or you can bear away and take it to leeward. Take one of those two options and rule 19 is going to apply. Uh, or the final option you might have is to tack and sail away in the other direction from it. And that scenario, rule 20, is going to apply. And we're going to go into the, both of those now. So let's start with rule 19. Uh, rule 19 hopefully starts with 19.1, when rule 19 applies. And so for a bit more on when, when this rule in particular applies. So rule 19 applies between two boats at an obstruction, except when the obstruction is a mark, the boats are required to leave on the same side. And when rule 18 applies between the boats and the obstruction is another boat overlapped with each of them. However, at a continuing obstruction, rule 19 always applies and rule 18 does not. Now rule 18, that's our mark room rule. Um, both Chris Atkins and John Napier are going to go into that in a lot more detail in episode four and episode six. So I'm not going to talk too much about that part B there. I'm going to leave that to them. Um, the only thing I will say, however, is this bit about continuing obstruction uh, in that final sentence. So if you remember before, I said a continuing obstruction is generally something like a shoreline. Uh, so if you were doing a race such as a, a round the island race, uh, then in that scenario the, where the island is the mark, then rule 19 would apply and rule 18 wouldn't uh, because it is a continuing obstruction. So that's where that last sentence might come into play. So let's go into the rule itself then. Uh, rule 19.2, giving room an obstruction. <clears throat> Part A, that is a right-of-way boat may choose to pass an obstruction on either side. So it's a right-of-way boat's choice. So you can choose which way to go. But when boats are overlapped, the outside boat shall give the inside boat room between her and the obstruction, unless she has been unable to do so from the time the overlap began. You'll see there's a third point there, it's point C. Uh, which are grayed out, that's about continuing obstructions, and we'll come back to that later. So before we go any further, let's just remind ourselves of a couple of definitions. So the definition of overlap, one boat is clear astern of another when our hull and equipment in normal position are behind a line, a beam from the aftermost point of the other boat's hull and equipment in normal position. The other boat is clear ahead the overlap when neither is clear astern. However, they also overlap when a boat between them overlaps both. These terms always apply to boats on the same tack. They apply to boats on opposite tacks only when relating applies between them or when both boats are sailing more than 90 degrees from the true wind. And then the definition of room, which is going to be quite important here, the space a boat needs in the existing conditions, including space to comply with our obligations under the rules of part two and rule 31 while manoeuvring promptly in a seaman-like way. So the rules of part two, that's the rules that we've been going through in this, in this series, all the rules we've been talking about, and rule 31, that's the rule that says that you can't hit a mark. So, we're approaching obstruction. So the first thing we need to decide, which boat is right of way? Well, it's a blue boat. Blue boat is leeward boat in this scenario, and so has right of way over the green boat. The next thing we need to ask ourselves is, are we approaching an obstruction? Uh, hopefully you all agree that the answer to that is yes. That yellow moored boat there is an obstruction. If we're sailing, more than uh, if we're sailing one of our hull lengths from it and directly towards it, then we are going to need to make a substantial alteration, of course. So it is an obstruction. 
So blue can choose which side to leave the obstruction. So you can either pass to windward of it or she can pass to leeward of it. So if she chooses to pass to windward of the obstruction, well, blue is still the right away boat. Green is a keep clear boat, rule 11, windward, leeward. We then need to ask ourselves, does blue have any obligations in this scenario? Yes, rule 16 applies. What's rule 16? Well, Matt covered that last week in the previous episode. And rule 16 says, when a right of way boat changes course, you shall give the other boat room to keep clear. So position between position two and position three in that diagram, when blue starts to luff, she needs to make sure that she is giving green the space she needs in the existing conditions uh, to be able to continue keeping clear of blue. Now, what if blue chose to pass to leeward of the obstruction? If she bore off. Well, again, blue is still the right of way boat. Yellow, uh, green, sorry, is still the keep clear boat under rule 11. She's a windward boat. Does blue have any obligations? Well, this time it is 19.2b which places an obligation on blue. And that's a rule that says when boats are overlapped, the outside boat shall give the inside boat room between her and the obstruction unless she has been unable to do so from the time the overlap began. So we can see here Blue has chosen at position two that she's going to pass to leeward. She bears off and she makes sure that she gives green enough space to come with her. So if you choose to pass to leeward of it, the outside boat must give the, the inside boat the room to come with her. Now, let's go back. We said we we're going to look at the rule to do with continuing obstruction. So that is 19.2c. That says while boats are passing a continuing obstruction, if a boat that was clear astern and required to keep clear becomes overlapped between the other boat and the obstruction, and at the moment the overlap begins, there is not room for her to pass between them, she is not entitled to room under rule 19.2b. While the boats remain overlapped, she shall keep clear and rules 10 and 11 do not apply. That's quite wordy. It's take a minute to have a look at that and remind yourself there of the definition of obstruction. And in particular, that final sentence, which really applies in this rule, that a vessel underway, including a boat racing, is never a continuing obstruction. So let's look at what that means in practice. So at position one, yellow is clear astern and required to keep clear. And then at position two, yellow has gained an overlap between blue and the shoreline. And so rule 19.2C does apply. So what we need to ask ourselves is, is there room for her to pass? Now, in order to determine whether there is room for her to pass. What we need to do is we need to freeze the position of the outside boat. So position two, as soon as yellow gets that overlap, we freeze the position of blue and we let yellow continue to move. We say, can yellow pass between blue and the obstruction at that point? And we can see that yes, she could. So because she can, uh, yellow is entitled now to rim from blue in order to pass the obstruction. So we can see here what what blue does is as they approach the headland, blue has to bear off and give yellow that rim to pass to also pass the obstruction. So that's rule 19 kind of covered. Now we're going to go into rule 20. What if we want to tack at the obstruction? Well, if we work through this flow diagram shows us how rule 20 works. So you want to hail for room to tack. Well, you first need to ask yourself, are you approaching an obstruction? 
If the answer to that is yes, then the next thing you need to ask yourself is, are you sailing close hold or above? Rule 20 only applies where boats are sailing above a close hold course. Uh, will you need to will you soon need to make a substantial course change? Uh, Rule 20 says that if you're you're approaching the obstruction and will soon need to make a substantial course change to avoid it safely. So if the answer to that is yes, then is the other boat on the same tack? It has to be between two boats on the same tack for this rule to apply. If the answer to all those four questions is yes, then you can hail for room to tack. If the answer to one of them is no, then you can't. Now, once you've hailed for room to tack, you then wait and you see what the hail boat responds. And as soon as you get a response from the, ta from the hailed boat, you need to tack as soon as possible. And so the rule says when a hailed boat responds, the hailing boat shall tack as soon as possible. Or what if you're the hailed boat? Well, in that scenario, has another boat hailed you for room to tack? Yes. You then get two options. You can either tack or you can carry on. If you want to tack, then you need to tack as soon as possible. If you want to carry on, then you should hail in response, you tack, and then give the other boat room to tack and avoid you. Now, just a slight health warning on this. Rule 20.2 on responding says, a hailed boat shall respond even if the hail breaks rule 20.1. Now, rule 19 and 20, rules around obstructions, are really there as safety rules. Uh, they're to protect boats and stop them from having to hit obstructions. So it doesn't matter. If you disagree with a hail that has been made, that doesn't matter. You must respond to the hail by either tacking or responding you tack and give the other boat room to tack and avoid. Your only remedy in that scenario is to protest if you disagree with the hail. So let's look at a scenario here where we could be short tacking up shoreline. So position one, a yellow has hailed for room to tack from blue. Blue has responded, you tack. So yellow then tacks. And you can see she completes her tack at position three. And blue has given her that room to tack, even though blue hasn't actually done anything. Yellow has had the space in order to be able to tack. Now, at position three, the boats are now on opposite tacks, with yellow on port and blue on starboard. So yellow has to tack back in order to avoid blue, as she is required to by rule 10. At position five, they are now back onto the same tack. Yellow is again having to shortly, will soon need to make a substantial alteration of course to avoid that obstruction. And so she is again entitled to hail for room to tack again. In this scenario, blue isn't able to hail you tack and give her that space. So her only option then is to tack off. Neil, can I ask you what would uh, happen if blue had another boat to windward of her? So say if green was to windward of blue, how would the scenario be different? Yeah, so if blue had another boat to windward of her, then blue would have to pass on the hail. Uh, so rule 20.3 uh, refers to passing on a hail to an additional boat. And it says, when a boat has been hailed for room to tack and she intends to respond by tacking, she may hail another boat on the same tack for room to tack and avoid her. She may hail even if her hail does not meet the conditions of rule 20.1. Rule 20.2 applies between her and a boat she hails. So here at position one, uh, Blue doesn't intend to, to actually tack uh, because she's responded you tack to yellow. So in that scenario, she wouldn't have to pass on the additional hail. But by the time we get to position four, position five, uh, when yellow for the second time hails for room to tack, then blue in that scenario would then have to pass on the hail. Uh, so she would need to hail room to tack herself 
and Praveen would then need to respond to that help. Now, here's another common scenario that we, we might see uh, where we're approaching a starboard tack boat. So we had two port tack boats there, the blue and the yellow boat, and the green starboard tack boat. So again, first thing we need to do, identify the right-of-way boat out of the pair. Well, yellow is to leeward of blue, therefore she is right-of-way over blue. Uh, are we approaching an obstruction? Yes. Green is starboard right of way over both blue and yellow. Therefore, she is an obstruction to blue and yellow. Will there need to be a substantial alteration of course? Will yellow need to make a substantial alteration of course to safely avoid green? Well, yes, we can see there if she carried on in a position four, she would be sailing straight through the middle of green. So she is going to need to make quite a large dip uh, in order to pass a stern of green. So yellow as a right of way boat can choose in that scenario to either hail for room to tack or to dip, dip the stern of green and give blue the room to come with her. Now, if we look at this scenario, which is essentially the same as the, the previous scenario, but blue and yellow have been moved slightly further down to leeward. Right, let's just run through the same questions we asked ourselves before, see what we get to. So again, we need to identify which is the right way boat out of the pair. Well, yellow is the boat to leeward of blue. So yellow is leeward right, and blue has to keep clear as a windward boat. Are we approaching an obstruction? Well, green is the starboard right way boat over both blue and yellow. And as a boat, if we were sailing directly towards her and one of her hull lengths away from her, then we would need to make a substantial course alteration in order to safely pass her. So green is an obstruction to us. And the next thing we need to ask is, uh, in this exact scenario, uh, will yellow need to make a substantial alteration of course to safely avoid green? Well, actually, no, because if we look at this scenario, we can see at position four, yellow, if she carried on, yellow is actually gonna just pass clear, as, uh, just pass a stern, of green uh, with either a very small or no change of course. Now blue, of course, if she carried on, she'd sail straight through the middle of green. Uh, what that means, because yellow, it doesn't have to make a substantial alteration of course, she is not entitled to hail for boom to tack from blue. So her only option is to dip green and give blue room to come with her. 1922b applies. 1922b says when boats are overlapped, the outside boat shall give the inside boat room between her and the obstruction. So, well, here we are. We've now, this is what we've covered in this episode. We've covered, we've done a quick recap of the right of way rules, uh, rules 10 through to 13. The Section B rules there, the rules that limit the right of way boat. Well, <clears throat> Matt had introduced us to Rule 15 uh, in the previous episode. We've now finished off 16 by looking at 16.1 and 16.2. We've gone into 17 a little bit, but as I said, much more of that to come when Mark Russell talks about sailing downwind. We spent most of our time here talking about Rules 19 and 20 around obstructions, and we've also covered off rule 23 there. So that's us now halfway through our, this series, and we've got most of the rules done. So over the, the remaining half of the series, we're going to cover marks, we're going to go into that in quite a lot of depth, and at some point we'll also look at rule 24, interfering. Now what we've done in, in this episode has been a fairly whistle-stop tour of some of the possible scenarios that you might come across uh, when it comes to obstructions. Now, some of the examples that I, I've used in this scenario, I've taken from the RYA casebook. Uh, now, the, the RYA casebook is similar to, to the World Sailing casebook in that it contains interpretations of the rules. Uh, where it differs from the World Sailing one is the World Sailing casebook is definitive interpretations, which must be followed. Uh, the RYA casebook is more 
uh, more guidance. But what I would say is that the people who write these cases and agree to publish them are the same people that uh, hear any appeals that the RYA do. So if you if you have a protest, if you're not quite sure what rules apply, uh, it's always a good idea to have a look at both the World Sailing and the RYA casebook, see if you can find any situations that are similar to the incident that you've had, and that might help you in your protest. So that's it for me, and I'll now hand you back to Chris. Thank you very much, Neil. Um, as Neil says, congratulations, everybody. You've now made it to the halfway point um, through our series, so well done for making it this far. If you're starting to find that things are getting a little bit more complicated and you're maybe not keeping up, um, then don't worry, you can go back and review the recording um, as many times as you want. So as soon as we're finished here, um, the recording will be reviewable, so you'll be able to go back and slowly look at those um, sections you want to see again. Um, so that hopefully everything will make um, some sense. If you've um, had a question, hopefully we've been able to answer that in the chat box, as they say, um, from now. Um, if you do have any questions, please put them in the comments bar below, um, which will be monitored um, and we'll hopefully answer them um, for you. If you have liked this video, then please do give it a like um, below. And if you have any comments or feedback for us about how we can improve the series or anything else you'd like to see, please also feel free to put that in the comments below. And um, we'll be taking a look at that um, to see how we can make this, this series even better for you. So as Neil says, we're going to see you um, same time next week, 8 p.m. on Wednesday. Um, and next week's session, we'll be looking at marks. So the rules that govern how we round the marks. Um, and that will be with Chris Atkins, who is an international judge and umpire. So with that, um, it's going to be goodbye from us. And we'll see you next week. Thank you. Bye.